here. <laughs> Dr. Stephen Ross, who is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU. And he used to be the Director of the Division of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse at the Psychiatry Department of Bellevue Hospital. He directs the NYU Addictive Disorders and Experimental Therapeutics Research Laboratory. And he is at the forefront of all sorts of really interesting research going on in terms of end of life and psilocybin, in terms of trauma and MDMA, in terms of addiction and psilocybin. So uh, when all these medicines get legalized, a lot of it will be due to what Stephen and his lab are doing. So he is here to talk about the cutting edge of these trials. Well, it's a, a real pleasure to be here. I wanted to thank uh, David Bronner for inviting me here. Um, I was going to uh, speak for half an hour today. The other half was going to be George Greer, who's the president of the Hefter Research Institute. He unfortunately couldn't make it to Bernie Man, so I'm going to give an update about what's going on with the Hefter uh, Institute as well, and I've been part of them for the last 13 years. Um, so I've been involved in psychedelic research since 2006, and I, uh, I learned nothing about psychedelics in medical school, zero. Uh, in my psychiatry residency, I also learned nothing other than maybe some urban legends about psychedelics that seven hits acid and you go insane and there's chromosomal damage. Uh, and really it was all of the propaganda that seeped into my medical training and none of the therapeutic uh, history of, of psychedelics. Um, it wasn't until 2006 that I first learned that psychedelics were actually a huge part of psychiatry. Uh, I was running the substance abuse division at the time at Bellevue, and, um, w which is a hospital I've been at for 19 years, and I really dedicated my career to helping the indigent and uh, people of color and, and people that are marginalized. Um, and that really had been my focus. Uh, and then in 2006, a colleague of mine started talking about uh, ayahuasca. And uh, as a drug expert, I thought I'd heard of every drug. I'd never heard of ayahuasca. I didn't know what he was talking about. Um, that was the same year that the Supreme Court ruled that the UDV legally could use ayahuasca as part of religious ceremony. Uh, and also that year, he told me that uh, Switzerland was commemorating the 50th anniversary um, they were uh, commemorating Albert Hoffman's birthday and, uh, and the discovery of LSD, and I couldn't figure out why anybody would be doing that. Um, it didn't take me long to, to, to find out that sort of hidden in plain sight there was a huge body of research uh, starting in the 40s going into the 70s, and it was not a small part of psychiatry. It was an enormous part of psychiatry. There were about 40,000 research participants, um, and it really uh, was so interesting to find out about everything that had happened. And so in 2006, myself, Jeff Gus, Tony Bossis, and Alex Belzer kind of out of nowhere formed a reading group, the NYU Psychedelic Reading Group. Um, and I didn't think that um, it would be possible to do research, but I was soon clued into the fact that research had started again. And one of the places it restarted was UCLA. And I uh, grew up in Los Angeles. I went to UCLA for medical school. And somebody introduced me to Charlie Grobe. And Charlie Grobe is really an amazing human being, an amazing mentor. Uh, and he was um, finishing up a trial using psilocybin to treat advanced cancer-related psychiatric and existential distress. And he really encouraged me to get involved and to do this. So um, I wrote a protocol. It was an extension of the UCLA one. It was sort of like dumb luck in picking the dose of psilocybin. It was single dose psilocybin versus placebo. We took patients at first that had terminal cancer, but over time we included people at any stage of cancer because um, you know, you don't have to be terminally ill with cancer to be scared out of your mind about it. It can be first diagnosis, it can be people with chronic forms of cancer that provoke this kind of existential crisis and demoralization and a hastened desire to want to be dead. And cancer is a, a really horrible thing from a psychiatric perspective, and about 40% 40 40 of people will de uh, develop depression or anxiety associated with. And, and that's associated with a bunch of very bad outcomes, including increased rates of completed suicide and decreased survivability from the cancer. There's a big link between depression and cancer and poor immune functioning and earlier death from cancer. Um, so we, we wrote the protocol. Um, there was no money. The federal government will not fund psychedelic research. They are allergic to it. And I'm going to give you an update, though, um, about a part of NIH that I think is close to funding a psychedelic study. And it's an extension of our cancer work. And that's very exciting, because there are certain parts of NIH, especially the addiction organizations, that are absolutely against this. Um, and the FDA I'll talk about as well, because they're extremely open-minded. 
So it took a full decade to do our cancer trial. Um, I didn't think we would get very far. I had a research mentor that told me it was the dumbest idea ever, that uh, I would never get federal funding. And where I work in academia at NYU, the benchmark is NIH funding. It's not private philanthropy. Um, but I sort of kept going. Even though Richard Nixon declared war on drugs and made psychedelics illegal, there was a route for clinical research to happen and a route to get a Schedule I drug. So I started the process. I applied to the FDA for an investigational new drug license. And because of people that had come before me, like Charlie Grobe and Roland Griffiths and others, um, I was given help with my IND application. And after 30 days, the FDA asked a couple questions, but they granted the IND, which was kind of amazing to me that in this short period of time, I had permission to administer psilocybin to cancer patients. Um, and then I started the process of getting uh, internal approval at Bellevue and working with the DEA. Uh, I mean, I had been working with the DEA for many years, um, and I came to find out that the DEA, you would think, is politically against this, and, and maybe they were at a certain period, but they were some of the most nicest people in all of this and, and continue to be very encouraging with this kind of research, which is sort of ironic given their mandate. Um, so the interesting thing is we had full approval to do the study from the inter uh, Internal Review Board, Institutional Review Board at NYU, from another Oncology Review Board, and I wanted to do it at Bellevue, but the head of Bellevue stepped in and said, there's no way I'm going to let you administer psychedelic drugs to dying African-American patients. We will not allow Bellevue to be in the media again. And that really was a, a real blow, because I, I love this hospital, and to be told that you can't do this here was really upsetting. Uh, but I understood it to a degree, and I thought really that was going to be the end of it. But what happened, um, and this is some really strange serendipity, the NYU College of Dentistry reached out to me to say, hey, we heard about this study. We'd like to help you. Um, and there was a lot of cognitive dissonance because I thought, dentistry? Like, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but it turned out that the head of the dental clinic uh, was actually dying of, uh, of terminal lung cancer. And because of that, he, there was this opening. He invited us to do the study there. So we were able to do the study at the College of Dentistry. They gave us a beautiful room. Um, and I, I was nervous that uh, knowing that psychedelics can create panic and anxiety, I was worried we were going to harm patients. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But after about 10 participants, it became very clear to me there was something very interesting going on, that those that appeared to get psilocybin by the end of the day, they were a lot better. They looked so much different. Um, and they said that they had resolution of death anxiety, that depression around cancer had melted away, anxiety had melted away, and they just felt better. And we brought them back in the next day. Um, and our whole treatment model is similar to a historical model of having diet therapy teams working with one uh, participant at a time, but there's a lot of preparation ahead of time. We do a life review with them. We take a review of um, the cancer diagnosis and how it's negatively affected them. The dosing days are very long. They're eight-hour sessions. It was a completely different thing that I was used to. I was used to 45-minute sessions. Um, and we started doing this, and after a while, I thought, you know, there's, there's something here. And then when we analyzed the data, it took a full decade to do the study, but when we analyzed the data, what we found was really astonishing to me that we found that one day after getting psilocybin compared to the placebo, there was this very rapid melting away of depression and anxiety. Um, and we found that there was a head-to-head -head between the psilocybin and the placebo for seven weeks. And what we found that the psilocybin was a rapidly acting antidepressant, anti-anxiety agent, and the effects lasted up to seven weeks. And at that point, there was a crossover. The group that got psilocybin first got the control and vice versa. But we were able to demonstrate that there was this very big uh, difference between the two groups, and it was highly clinically significant. So for instance, one day after getting psilocybin, 80% of the people no longer met criteria for depression. Their depression, they didn't meet the criteria anymore. Um, and that continued at seven weeks. And then we looked at it at the very end, six and a half months, the effects persisted. At six and a half months, there, te there seemed to be this very long tail of therapeutic improvement. We also found improved quality of life um, associated with psilocybin. We found decreased existential distress, decreased demoralization syndrome, decreased hopelessness around death. We had some changes around uh, death anxiety um, as well. And so from this data, um, this was published uh, December 1st, 2016. We published a very similar study with Johns Hopkins, and they found almost exactly the same thing. And this was a big media story. It ended up on the front page of the New York Times. 
Um, and there were 11 uh, psychiatrists throughout the world, leading psychiatrists, chairs of departments of psychiatry, head of the American, a couple of heads of the American Psychiatric Association, who wrote these editorials, and they, you know, really sort of the inside of organizational psychiatry and said, this research is interesting and should continue. And, and it was a big media story. So we were excited from that data, and as part of that, uh, and we've been working very closely with Bill Linton and, and uh, for many years, Bill is uh, really such an amazing supporter and donor over the years, I'm so grateful to you, Bill. Um, but USONA formed, and they took the data from our group and from Hopkins, and we went to the FDA, and I was at that meeting, and we were very excited to continue to go to the next step with cancer, but the FDA was very skeptical, and they said, well, cancer, depression, that's, you know, why, why just specifically focus on cancer? Why not something like major depression? It's one of the biggest causes of global disability, um, and it's 10% of the population. Why don't you think more broadly? And so that's what USONA did. That was the guidance that they got. And so USONA uh, developed a trial, which Bill spoke about earlier, that we're uh, proud to be part of at NYU, that we're going to be recruiting in about a month using psilocybin to treat major depression. Um, so the cancer work sort of, um, it was unclear what was happening next. And I gave a talk in Sweden, the Swedish uh, Psychedelic Society in October, and I gave a whole talk about psychedelics to treat advanced cancer-related psychiatric and existential distress. And at the end of the talk, my final slide was like, it was unclear what the next step was. I, I didn't know what was gonna happen with the research. And there was someone, um, a Spanish psychedelic researcher, Deborah. Deborah, are you anywhere in the room? No, Deborah is not here, but I, I saw her recently. She came up to me afterwards and was crying. And she was like so upset knowing that there was, there was no next step. And how could that be? And there was um, a couple patients with terminal cancer at the conference that came up to me and asked me the same thing. And it's horrible. We have a list of thousands of patients that have terminal cancer that write to us, and they think we have a psilocybin clinic, and we don't. We just did one study. It's still a Schedule One drug, and it's illegal. But my interaction with her and these patients sort of emboldened me to get that work started again. And so um, I decided that I'm going to go for NIH. I'm going to try to get NIH to cross that threshold to fund psychedelic research. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I first went to NIMH, National Institute on Mental Health, because right? I've gotten funding from National Institute on Drug Abuse before and the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse. The head of NIAAA uh, is, hates psilocybin. He goes on these rants about it. The head of NIDA doesn't like it as well. They sort of act anti-scientific, and they just say this is bad for our kids. But the head of the National Institute on Mental Health, I knew him. I went to residency with him. He was one year below me. So I wrote him out of the blue uh, in November, and I said, would you, uh, would NIMH ever be interested in funding psychedelic research? Again, because NIMH spent several million dollars on psychedelic research uh, in the late 60s. And he wrote back to me immediately. He said, I love psilocybin. I think this is a great idea. I encourage you to apply to NIMH. Uh, yeah. So I, he, he actually got me in touch with five section chiefs at NIMH. We had this big meeting, and it was going okay for about 15 minutes. They were very encouraging, and at some point, they said, well, what kind of study do you want to do? And I said, I want to do the definitive phase three trial and about 200 participants to show that this is a real effect. And they said, oh, no, 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 we don't do phase three trials. I'm sorry. And it was like, it felt like I got punched in the nose, like, at that point. Um, and they said, we're interested in the neurobiologic mechanism of psilocybin, so you can apply to us to do a neuroimaging study or genetics, and we would encourage that. So I was th thinking of doing that, but I thought, you know, this is a cancer population, so what about the National Cancer Institute? Now, I've never been funded by NCI before, and I knew nothing about them, but I spoke to the head of our Cancer Institute, and he really got behind this, and he said, I'm going to find the, the group at NCI that is interested in this. And uh, separately, independently, there was a group at UC Denver in Colorado that reached out to me and they said, we love this. It was uh, the woman who's the head of palliative care research. And she's also working with minority populations. And she, and she had been funded by NCI for over 20 years. So uh, 
we teamed up together, this amazing group at UC Denver, um, and they also independently found the same person that the head of our Cancer Institute found at NCI whose portfolio deals with palliative care, terminal illness, people that have existential distress and depression. And we both got to this program officer and we had a meeting with her over the phone and it was really remarkable. She was so excited by this idea, she said she knew about it and she said she was happy that somebody was finally applying uh, to NCI. So. Uh, we wrote an R01, an R01 uh, is a five-year grant, it's a $2 million grant. We wrote an R01 to NCI, we checked in with her repeatedly, we just submitted it a couple weeks ago, and she's given us the big thumbs up that um, NCI is going to review this very carefully. I asked her if there's any politics above her level that would play out that would prevent this, like at other agencies. She said she checked and she got the green light from the head of NCI for us to apply. So we applied, we find out in October. And if we get funded in October, uh, it will be historic because that means the NIH will again be funding psychedelic research. It'll be done by the National Cancer Institute um, and it'll really give a huge imprimatur to, to what we're doing because the federal government you know, made psychedelics illegal. They then coerced the rest of the world to make them all illegal. But the, the rest of the world is confused by what we're doing now. You know, all of this stuff with cannabis and psychedelics and there's a lot that's changing. The FDA is the most open-minded and that's the other thing I'm trying to link this process to. So um, I've been working with the USONA group. There's a recent uh, new executive there, Rob Barrow, and he and I were talking about the cancer work and going back and forth and Rob had this brilliant idea because the division of psychiatry products that we'd gone to, they said there's you know, you should go for depression. And anyway, what is this DSM diagnostic criteria? It's like all these different diagnostic things. We're only used to like one thing. Um, so Rob had this brilliant idea to go after the division of oncology products. This is the part of the FDA that deals with treatments for oncology. And it's usually chemotherapy drugs, but they have tested drugs before that have to do with quality of life. And USONA is about to submit a pre-IND to FDA to ask their division of oncology products if we can move forward to phase three trials. Um, and if that happens, it'll be a, 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 similar to the time that NCI will let us know. If that all happens, this will be the leading edge of psilocybin moving towards a prescribable medication. We will do a phase three trial that will be funded by NCI and that will be uh, approved by the FDA. Um, the work with depression is just starting. There's about 10 people in the world that have been treated with psilocybin that have depression. That was at Imperial. But there's 92 people that have received psilocybin in, in randomized controlled trials between the UCLA group, Johns Hopkins, and NYU. That is by far the most mature data. Um, now, interestingly, in the historical era, the most mature data was alcoholism. It was LSD for alcoholism. Um, and when I looked at this, I got really excited as an addiction psychiatrist because I thought, that's it, we should restart with LSD and alcoholism. But LSD is incredibly evocative. You know, those three words bring up all kinds of crazy things with administrators. And people have it seared into their consciousness that LSD is horribly addictive, which it's not, it's anti-addictive. But the idea of giving LSD to treat alcoholism was gonna be too much. So there was a strategy to go with psilocybin and for terminally ill patients. Um, but the work, um, so, so that's the, the update with the work with cancer, and I can maybe come back to that a little bit later. I, I wanna tell you what we're doing with alcohol. Um, and we have a trial using, a randomized control trial using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for alcoholism. This was an idea started by Michael Bogenschutz at the University of New Mexico. Um, he also looked at this data, he's an addiction psychiatrist as well, and he and I teamed up uh, to, to do a study using psilocybin to treat alcoholism. We're nearing completion of that study. We treated 80 out of 100 participants. We're gonna be done in about a year. Uh, that study is funded by the Hefter Research Institute. Uh, and I'm really excited by that because of all drugs of abuse, by far the most damaging drug of all of them is alcohol. Alcohol is horribly toxic to every part of the body. Um, it causes cancer, it causes premature death. You wouldn't know it because it's legal, it's omni-available, but it is uh, really horrible. At Bellevue, the number one diagnosis in my entire hospital is alcohol withdrawal. So from a public health perspective and, and being an addiction practitioner, going after alcohol, is extremely important and the data with LSD and alcoholism was a, a very encouraging. So we're gonna publish that in about a year and a half and, and we'll see what's happening with that uh, data as well. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna be doing the psilocybin depression trial. That's starting soon. Um, another interesting trial that we're finishing up that's funded by the Council for Spiritual Practice 
is the use of psilocybin uh, administration to religious professionals like rabbis and priests. And we're doing this in conjunction with Johns Hopkins. And it's, um, who's heard of the Good Friday experiment? Anyone heard? Yeah. So the Good Friday experiment was this amazing experiment conducted by Walter Pankey, who was both a psychiatrist um, and a PhD in divinity at Harvard. And uh, he had this idea that um, he, he knew that in different mystical branches of religion, the mystical states, there was a certain commonality to them. He also knew that anthropologically, people that use psychedelics had experiences very similar to these mystical experiences described in religion. So he gave high dose psilocybin to 10 divinity students and the placebo niacin to 10. He put them in the Marsh Chapel uh, in 1960, piped organ music into them, and found that 70% of those that had psilocybin had mystical experiences. Um, and Rick Doblin did a follow-up to the Good Friday experiment. 33 years later, he tracked down all these individuals, and um, the vast majority of them said that that experience informed their work in the clergy and was one of the most meaningful and spiritual experiences uh, of their lives. So uh, we decided... Um, So this is our one trial in, in normal volunteers. The, the idea, and what, what we found is that the mystical experience appears to mediate the therapeutic effects. We found this, the Hopkins group found this, that the intensity of this mystical experience questionnaire uh, seems to be one of the drivers of decreased anxiety and depression. So we're hoping that religious professionals will be able to tell us something more about that experience. We're also interested to see how it um, changes their views of spirituality, uh, religion, or deepens it. Um, and what happens after this, you know, I'm not sure, but certainly divinity trainees that want to have some sort of experience with the divine in a direct kind of way that potentially could be part uh, of training. So that study is probably going to be punished, uh, uh, published in a, in a couple years, um, and we'll see what happens. Um, so that, that's the main work with psilocybin that we're doing at NYU, but there's other directions that we're going. So Michael Bogenschutz is really amazing uh, research partner and friend. He's written, uh, written a protocol using psilocybin to treat opiate addiction. Uh, there's several treatments for opiate addiction medications. One of them is uh, naltrexone or Vivitrol. So he's written uh, a protocol to the National Institute on Drug Abuse to study that. Uh, and that's the other important thing that our lab wants to move in the direction. We have this huge opiate epidemic. 50,000 people died of an opiate overdose last year. I've been hearing stories about, you know, fentanyl and heroin on the playa here and, and people overdosing. So it's, for those that treat opiate addicts, it's a horrible illness. And it's, it's so important that we go in that direction. Um, I'm also interested in Ibogaine to treat opiate addiction. Ibogaine is incredibly unique among the psychedelics in that it treats opiate withdrawal and has nothing to do with the psychological properties. There's something going on that's unique there. Uh, the problem with Ibogaine, there's been deaths associated with it. And I know that Rick, uh, Rick Doblin, who's in the back, is, uh, wants to de-risk Ibogaine and is going to be applying uh, to the FDA to do an Ibogaine study and to have continuous cardiac monitoring. Um, I've written a grant to the National Institute on Drug Abuse to study 18 methoxycorn artery, which is a Ibogaine congener. It doesn't appear psychedelic, but it doesn't have the, the heart toxicity. And Rick, when I mentioned that to him, he said, that's really boring. <laughs> He's like, that's not psychedelic. Why would you study that? So. Um, we're heading in some boring directions. Um, we're also interested in bromo LSD as an example for cluster headaches. There doesn't appear to be any psychoactive effects. And I've also moved in the direction of cannabinoid research. Um, even though NIH will not fund any THC therapeutic research, they're funding CBD research. So one of my areas of interest is the intersection between chronic pain and addiction. So I wrote a grant to NIDA to study CBD in patients that have chronic pain that are on opiates as a way to get them off of their opiates and to replace the CBD, to replace the opiate with the yeah. CBD. So, so um, we're, we're excited about that. We also, Michael Bogenschutz has an active trial administering high dose CBD to alcoholics. Uh, so we're, we're headed, headed in that direction as well. Um, and then the last thing I want to tell you what we're doing in our lab before getting into the other Hefter projects, and then I'm going to open it up for questions, is that um, it's a real miracle, but we are part of the MAPS Phase Three MDMA for PTSD trial. Um, um, 
Now, my, my boss had called me up a couple years ago and uh, when there was, you know, MDMA was uh, sort of making some inroads and, he, and he's a PTSD expert. He said, I want you to know we will never study MDMA at NYU. And I said to him, but I never mentioned that to you. Why are you, you know, why are you mentioning that to me? He said, let me repeat. Well, I'm going to tell you, we're never going to study MDMA for PTSD at NYU. So he said that, um, but then Rick was all over the New York Times and uh, the, the New York Times called my boss, who's a PTSD expert, and said, hey, we'd like, uh, we'd like you to give a quote about this you know, new MDMA for PTSD that the FDA wants to give them breakthrough status. Like, what do you think about that? So um, my boss called me, didn't reach me, he reached Michael Bogenschutz and said to him, hey, what is the deal with MDMA for PTSD? And Michael said to him, I think this is gonna be the biggest breakthrough in PTSD research and treatment ever, and so. Yeah, yeah the, the timing was great. So um, he, there was a quote in the New York Times from my boss that was like, yeah, yeah, this could be interesting. At the bottom of it, he said, well, it can also cause addiction and death, and, but I saw the part where he gave a positive quote. So. I just sort of forgot what he had said to me earlier, and uh, I called up Rick and I said, well, you know, I'm gonna like talk to him and see if like there's any chance that, and Rick has a history with him as well in terms of what happened at the San Francisco VA, and, um, but, and I said, I wrote to him, oh, uh, I wanna meet with you about a phase three trial PTSD. It didn't mention MDMA, and I had a meeting with him. I thought he would like freak out on me, but he didn't. I, and I mentioned the research, and he said, oh, that sounds interesting. So I said, would you be interested in meeting Rick Doblin? And he was like, sure. So uh, Michael Bogenschutz and I, we were all ready to kind of help facilitate Rick meeting my boss, and Rick shows up, and uh, um, the two of them headed off like two old friends from the old school. It was pretty, pretty remarkable. It didn't have to do too much at all. Uh, I think you had some family in common. Whatever it was, Michael and I said zero during the meeting. And, you know, Rick is enormously charming. And at the end of it, my chair said, cool, we're in. So, you want me to, do you want to say something? About our remind, remind me, you have to remind. Oh, okay. Charlie Barber was the first one in the VA in 1990 to say no to MDMA research. And so Steve said, don't remind him of that, he probably forgot it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I let Rick know about his psychology. Um, but he can be persuaded, he's very conservative. And that's the thing, working at NYU, it's a very conservative institution. You know, I was the only way I was able to pull this off is that I had a leadership position. And I think some of you have heard Rachel Yehuda speak, which is remarkable that someone at her level of leadership and expertise would take something like this on. And that's really what's needed in academic institutions for somebody who has a position of power to be brave enough to say, I'm gonna do this. Um, so we are doing the trial. We've treated three people with MDMA open label in the lead into it. I'm, I'm one of the therapists. And I'd always thought this is a great target, it makes so much sense, I'd heard the amazing stories, but um, the first uh, participant that we treated is um, mid-30s African-American male, and, and you probably, people have been asking questions about people of color in psychedelic research, they don't exist at all. Historically, there was some, and so it's a, we're making a big push at Bellevue to be able to recruit from our clinic there. But the first person grew up poor in the Bronx, he's an African-American gentleman, who had had horrible trauma, his dad was incredibly violent, towards him, and so that was his index trauma. He had horrible PTSD, but three weeks before uh, he started, his girlfriend died. His girlfriend died, um, she was an alcoholic, and she died of alcoholic pancreatitis, so he had this new trauma. So his first MDMA session, and there's three of them, was the intention was dedicated towards his girlfriend, um, and he had the most amazing experience. He had also had a psilocybin experience recreationally where he was able to pull that into it all, and. Um, by the end of the session, he looked so different. When we looked at his scores later, he no longer met criteria for PTSD after one session. Um, wow. 
But what's great about that treatment is it's layered in. So we had a second one. The second one, his main intention was addiction. He said, I don't know why, but I have to focus this, section, this session on addiction. And his dad was a cocaine addict, alcoholic. His girlfriend died of alcoholism. So we, we talked about uh, addiction in the second session. And the last session was all about his dad. And he was able to come to this loving place with his dad and to forgive his dad. And after the session, uh, he actually has been trying to get his dad into the MDMA session because he realized his dad was traumatized too and that this was intergenerational trauma and he was able to forgive his dad. And it was uh, really, really remarkable. Um, The other two participants as well, same sort of story that they, um, all of them, the other two participants no longer met criteria after the first session. So I, I think, um, Rick, you're really on to something here. And uh, we're, it's an honor and privilege for us at NYU to be part of that trial. I, I know that maybe we're a little bit on the expensive side, and, uh, but you know, it's Manhattan. And, uh, <laughs> um, but we're gonna do whatever we can to contribute to that study. Um, so the other stuff that I, I want to mention, I, I've also done work with ketamine. I've done work with um, IV ketamine in patients that are um, acutely suicidal, have treatment-resistant depression. Uh, so we're also interested in ketamine. So our lab, we've administered several Schedule One drugs, psilocybin, MDMA, um, CBD now, uh, and uh, we've done ketamine research. Uh, and there's so many different directions to go, and I'll, I'll mention some of them, but I want to get into the amazing work that the Hefter Research Institute is doing. Um, I've been part of Hefter for the last 13 years, and Hefter was started by Dave Nichols, I believe, in 1993, and, and Dave, like Rick, is another visionary. And uh, Dave is a medicinal chemist, the world's leading medicinal chemist, and he saw that there was an opportunity to get this research going again, and he has been pushing hard Hefter has done such amazing research. So I want to go through some of the other projects. In addition to the psilocybin alcohol project, they're funding a psilocybin tobacco addiction project. So tobacco is the number one cause of preventable death in the U.S. About 500,000 people die prematurely uh, from it, and we got a, a big problem with, with tobacco. Matt Johnson uh, at Johns Hopkins is also about 75% through a study there and about 100 participants. That's psilocybin versus nicotine replacement. So it's really amazing that both alcoholism and tobacco are being studied. Uh, and we're going to find out. Matt will be done in about two years with that project. Hefter is also funding a study at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, using psilocybin to treat opiate addiction. This is led by Randy Brown. And um, these are participants that are put on Suboxone, which is buprenorphine. It's a, a partial mu agonist to help opiate addicts. The idea is can psilocybin on top of that improve outcomes for opiate addiction? Um, one of my, probably my most favorite study that's going on that I think many people don't know about, who, who's heard of Peter Hendricks at the University of Alabama? So Peter is a, a really amazing guy. Um, he contacted our, our group several years ago, and he's a psychologist that's interested in criminal recidivism and addiction, and he wanted to reprise the Concord Prison Experiment. Who's heard of the Concord Prison? Yeah, so this was a really amazing experiment conducted by Timothy Leary. The idea was can psilocybin help decrease sociopathy and criminal recidivism? He got permission to go into the Concord Prison in the early 60s and administer psilocybin in a group setting to prisoners. He also got permission to do it himself. You know, back in the, in the wild days of psychedelic research, you could do crazy stuff like that. Um, and he, uh, he found, uh, initially he published that there was decreased recidivism, but this was another long-term project of Rick's where Rick went in and, and realized that the data was misrepresented and was not accurate. And it, in the end, it left a question mark, could this be helpful or not? And in the modern era, Peter Hendricks has picked that up. He almost got permission from the Alabama Department of Corrections to take recent parolees and administer psilocybin to them. But what happened is a recent parolee went out and like killed someone. And so that spooked them and they said no. So Peter decided to study crack cocaine addiction. Now crack cocaine addiction, we've heard a lot about the opiate epidemic, but the prevalence of cocaine addiction is still high. There's still about a million cocaine addicts and overdose deaths from cocaine and methamphetamine have been increasing in recent years. There are no treatments for cocaine addiction medication wise. So Peter Hendricks wrote a protocol using psilocybin to treat crack cocaine addiction. And so far, he's treated 20 out of 40 individuals at University of Alabama getting approval there 
has been really remarkable. And they've been all essentially homeless African-American individuals. Um, so it's, it's amazing that he's been able to recruit from that population. He's sort of like my idol in that way. That study, the preliminary analysis, shows that there is a large treatment effect in their interim analysis that they've done. So um, I, I feel pretty good that that is also going to be a historic study, and that's going to be coming in the next coming years. Um, what else about Hefter? Hefter, um, Franz Vollenweider is really a, a psychedelic research pioneer at University of Zurich, and he um, has done amazing neuroscience and neuroimaging with psychedelics. He's now moving in the direction of clinical applications, so they're going to be using psilocybin to treat depression, and also they want to use it to treat alcoholism, and Hefter is going to be funding that as well. Um, it's a really exciting time to be a psychedelic researcher. The first maybe 10 years, I thought, this is insane. It's so dumb. I made the worst decision. Like, this is never going to happen. It's going to take forever. Um, but something's happened in the last couple years, and it's actually now hard to keep track of how quickly things are happening. It's like you know, exponential, and it's breaking out everywhere. And I, I think that you have all these academic medical centers within the U.S. that are bringing this back. It's being brought back within the heart of academia and organized medicine and psychiatry. Um, the, the, the FDA, this is the last thing I really want to mention, they are, their arms are wide open. There was recently a meeting at Arizona, uh, a conference there, and a couple people from USONA were there, and the head of the Division of Psychiatry Products was there, and they could not be more excited about developing psilocybin. So I think that, uh, and MDMA, they've given breakthrough status to MDMA, they've given breakthrough status to psilocybin or treatment-resistant depression, um, and I think soon that the work with terminal cancer patients is going to be the leading edge of moving things forward. But between the terminal cancer, between addiction and depression, one of those things is going to put psilocybin over the line. And um, Rick, when is MDMA going to be rescheduled? What's your... The end of 2021. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what what he said. So, um, now I think psilocybin is a little bit beyond that, Bill. I think you said 2022 or 22, yeah. Um, but it, it's coming, and, and this is going to profoundly change psychiatry, profoundly. We are, the tools that we have in psychiatry are not great. You know, our medications have enormous side effects. Uh, a lot of times they don't work that well. It's better than 100 years ago when we had nothing, and patients suffered horribly. So psychotropics have helped millions of individuals, whether it's antipsychotics or antidepressants, but they leave a lot to be desired. And when you look at things like SSRIs and cognitive behavioral therapy, and then you look at something like MDMA or psilocybin, it's, it's so much more exciting and gratifying. And being a clinician doing this work, it's really really changed me. Working with the terminally ill was a profound thing because in all my medical training, nobody taught me how to help a patient come to terms with death or how to have a good death. You just give chemo until the end. Doctors don't give up, you know, otherwise we're failures. And that, that trial taught me a lot about how to really step back, zoom out, and really meet someone where they're at and help them have a good death. Half of the patients in our cancer study have died and we were at their bedside a lot of the times when they died. We came to their funerals. We're about to publish a long-term follow-up to our cancer trial. We were able to locate 16 out of the original 29 who were still alive, and this is going to be published in the coming months. What we found five years afterwards is that their distress never came back. Their anxiety and depression, five years, one day afterwards, their distress came down to very low levels, and five years later in the small cohort that we found, the distress never came back. Um, But I think we have to have healthy skepticism because in, in science, in the beginning, you know, there's a saying, use something early on because, you know, there can be a lot of like bias. They're kind of, the researchers are very enthusiastic about this and we could all be a little bit blinded and, and think there's something there and there may not be. So we have to do bigger trials. We have to follow the science and the data and see, see where the truth lies. Uh, but my prediction is that um, psychedelics are gonna transform psychiatry in a profound way. Um, and I'm so excited to be part of that. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's my speech. I'm going to open it up for questions now and discussion. I can yell really loud. What is uh, psilocybin? And also, you said something about 
LSD and cluster headaches, but it wasn't just LSD. There was another word in there. Could so you elaborate the, on that a little more? Yeah. So we, it's taken a while to figure out the exact correct clinical dose, but it's about 20 to 30 milligrams. So in the USONA depression trial, we're doing a fixed dose now of 25 milligrams. In our cancer trial, it was 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, which for the average 70 kilogram person was around 21 milligrams. And it's synthetic, and how that relates to street mushrooms, it's probably you know, four to five grams of street mushrooms. So these are big doses. Um, the, what I mentioned with the cluster headaches is bromo LSD. LSD is extremely psychoactive. Bromo LSD activates the 2A receptor, but it doesn't cause any subjective effects, but it appears to help cluster headaches. So, you know, we have Ibogaine is psychedelic, 18MC is not, LSD psychedelic, bromo LSD is not. THC is, you know, has psychoactive properties, CBD does not. So there's a totally different direction. And then there's the work of Chuck Nichols, at, um, at LSU, Louisiana, where he found that psychedelics have anti-inflammatory properties, that it has anti-asthma effects. So there are so many different directions to go, uh, not just sort of in the mental health space, but in uh, medical and neurologic disorders. Or, I mean, is microdosing not useful? I don't, I'm just curious. Well, my, microdosing is so interesting. There's so much anecdote and hype about it that you read about it. My mom called me recently. She's like, uh, should I microdose? And I was like, what? My mom, what are you talking about? She said, I heard it's amazing for depression. And I was like, well, no one's ever studied that. All, all we know is a ton of anecdote. So microdosing needs to be studied and there are groups that are studying it now we need to know the basic sort of psychological and cognitive effects i think it could have clinical applications like depression like adhd um, but we really are in the very early stages of microdosing and we don't know too much other than it's very promising studies or you um have research partners that are sourcing your CBD, or that you're sourcing CBD from for the, for the alcohol treatment and things like that? The question that. is about the source of CBD. Um, there's, we tried to get it from GW Pharmaceuticals, but they wouldn't give it to us. We had another company, Tilray, that wanted to charge us $200,000 for it, so uh, finally we got a company that said that they would provide it for free, but then we found out later they were a part of a Ponzi scheme, so they're gone. So that, um, it's hard to get good GMP CBD. We have a group now in New York City that's going to provide it for us. Um, but it's challenging. The alcohol grant that Michael Bogenschutz wrote, he almost had to give it back to NIAAA because he could not get anyone to provide uh, GMP CBD. But I, I think that's solved now. Yeah. So the question is, um, what's the difference between a, a session with MDMA and a, and a normal session? Normal meaning like a 45 minute psychotherapy, yeah. It's completely different. First of all, there's two therapists. I was trained, one therapist, one patient. There's, there's two therapists and you're there for eight hours. It's an incredibly long day. The first time I ever did it with a cancer patient, I was so exhausted by the end of the day, I went home and went straight to sleep. Um, but over a while, it's a kind of a muscle that you, you learn to be there in a kind of meditative place. And a lot of times there's not much going on. You know, we do a ritual with them. Um, we give them the pill. We have the default is them to lie on the couch on their back to put eye shades and pre-selected music. And often like nothing happens for six hours. Then they get up and they tell us these, you know, really remarkable places they've gone to and things that have happened. Sometimes ha someone's having a really challenging experience and we'll set them up, we'll take the eye shades off, we'll soothe them, we'll ground them through touch, we'll remind them they're gonna be okay. We have medications in the room, we have a benzodiazepine, an antipsychotic, if need be, but we've never had to use those, essentially. Uh, but it's a completely different form of therapy, it, and MAPS is doing a great job thinking ahead, how do we train people? Um, Uh, thank you for your time. Is there any pushback from the pharmaceutical industry knowing that antidepressants will be a thing of the past? And uh, have there been any studies on neurogenesis with TBI and stroke? Um, 
So I, when I first started doing this, I had a bunch of people tell me, pharma's going to hate you, you better watch out, they're going to try to assassinate you, and I was like, that's conspiracy theory stuff, I don't, I don't know if they care. But it did make sense that this could destroy their model. Their model is a pill every day forever, you know, you make a lot of money with that. This is like maybe one or two treatments and then somebody may be cured. It's completely different, but interestingly, the, exo the opposite has happened. There's now at least a half a dozen to a dozen pharma-like entities that are, want to get involved in this space, and there's an enormous amount of interest. So I think pharma is coming in and is going to try to get involved, co-opt it. Um, I mean, that's why I, I love USONA and MAPS, that they have this nonprofit vision. I mean, that is really amazing that uh, Bill and Rick are making this available for humanity, for the good of humanity rather than for a profit. But um, it's, it's going to happen rapidly that pharma entities are going to get involved. Your other question was about TBI. Um, we, we've had to exclude people like that. The FDA specifically said you cannot give this to people with neurologic injury, but um, people with neurologic injury have a lot of psychiatric distress. People with early Alzheimer's feel horrible. Johns Hopkins has written a protocol to give psilocybin to people that have early Alzheimer's as a way to help them cope with that. And uh, there will be studies looking at neurologic injury. So it has been taboo because it's the brain, but, um, you know, and psychedelics also have the potential for neurogenesis. I mean, it's possible that they could even sort of, um, you know, enhance brain plasticity and neuronal growth. So we'll have to see. Well, we, we, when I started doing this, I, I was the head of our addiction fellowship program, so I was a training director, and I realized this is such a unique, specific form of therapy that I developed the NYU Psychedelic Psychotherapy training program. It's been run by Jeff Gus. Over the last 10 years, we've trained about 50 people to, to give psilocybin within our protocols. And so we developed a whole training that including how did the dyad team get trained with each other? How do you learn about the disease state? How do you learn about psychedelics? How do you learn about sitting for people and, and seeing what emerges? Um, MAPS has developed a psych uh, an MDMA training program. And as part of that, they're illegally allowed to administer MDMA to trainees. Which is, which is really awesome because I you know, often give talks and people want to know like if I ever done a psychedelic or it's a, an awkward question to be answering given that it's illegal, but we're going to do something similar that we're going to create a psilocybin training program and include psilocybin administration to our trainees. We're yet to do that and we're, um, uh, and there are no psilocybin training programs that exist right now outside of academia. It had to be somebody that was a faculty member at NYU. Our, uh, my boss was very strict. He wanted like only licensed individuals, and the FDA has its standards as well. But you know, it's it's important to make this available to people that are interested. And and uh, and there's an enormous amount of interest in young people that are interested in this. And um, I think it'll be an awesome career for people. Go ahead. So the question is, Matt, is, is there any research uh, going on with uh, outdoors? Uh, I think it'd be awesome to do a study outdoor in the woods. Um, you know, people have amazing experiences on psychedelics in the woods and in nature and connecting there, but our ethics review board, I think, would not allow us to do that. Um, you know, it's, it, we're so constrained. But Franz Vollenweider at Zurich has gotten permission to administer psilocybin. I believe it's to religious professionals there, and they, they did it in a group setting out in the woods. So Franz showed it can be done. I think they had like a bunch of medical people there. Not that you need it for psilocybin, it's completely safe. But I, I think that's the next thing to consider. But with, within academia, that's hard to pull off. In New York City, we have First Avenue there, so it's not, not too conducive. Go ahead. That, that's a tough one. I, you do need somebody senior in the institution to go to to take this on because if someone's too junior, it's not going to happen. But um, at UCSF was a good example. There were some junior people, this guy Brian Anderson and Josh Woolley, 
and they were like, we want to do this. And they pushed their chair, who initially said, no, no, we're not going to do this. Uh, they pushed his chair with the help of like a local philanthropist to say, okay, we're, we're going to do it. So get somebody powerful at the institution who's into it and get them to go make sure the politics are okay. But I, I think if you, again, getting back to Rachel Yehuda, you have very powerful people that suddenly within institutions are like, yeah, you know, I've studied this disorder my whole life and the treatments kind of suck, you know, this is like exciting, so. I just wanted to know your thoughts on the, um, the impact of microbiome balance or imbalance with alcohol. Um, we know with a lot of the indigenous medicines like ayahuasca, really, you know, even without the science, the indigenous know that it works a lot on the gut and we do use it for a lot with people with um, alcoholism. So just wondering if there's any way to work with that for aftercare, integration, or, or what are your thoughts on, on if that's important? <laughs> Well, the, the question is about the microbiome and, and alcoholism. The microbiome is amazing. We arguably have more bacteria in our bodies than human cells, depending. And we got a rich supply down in our gut, and we have like a whole second brain in our gut, the enteric nervous system. And it's mysterious what it's, what it's all doing. The right combination of bacteria we're finding out is very important for not only physical health, but mental health. And people are looking at the microbiome and its association with disease states, including alcoholism and and people have started looking to fecal transplants as a way to make some of these things better. I've never seen a study with the microbiome and psychedelics, so that could be a research project. Um, but yeah, the, the microbiome is mysterious and uh, should be studied more. So earlier in the USANA talk, they were talking about uh, the kind of pop psychology view of how psychedelics just attach to the 5H2A receptors. I forgot what they're called. Um, but in reality, most likely, which is what we don't know a lot about right now, um, there's a giant network effect that is happening. So I was kind of connecting this to worrying about the replication crisis in psychology right now. And I'm wondering if you know, as a researcher, the more, I mean, if we're obviously going to keep making a bunch of discoveries as time goes on. Do, do you worry about uh, your studies not being able to be replicated in, say, you know, five, ten years? And would that have a potential negative impact on funding, you know, anything, you know, social integration? So the question is about reproducibility within science, yeah? There was a recent study looking at like top 100 articles within the mental health field, and they tried to reproduce them, and it was very depressing. They were unable to reproduce most of the findings that, um, and, and that's the thing in research, you can make what's called a type one error or a false discovery rate, and we may have done that with these trials. That's why you need to replicate, you need much larger samples to really find the truth. Because you can sample a small population and get something, but it may not be representative of the total uh, sample. Yeah, I think we need to be skeptical. I think we have to assume that there's, there's no treatment effect. Um, and I mean, that's the null hypothesis. And if we do a larger study and it shows that it works, then we're able to say, yeah, this is a real treatment, and then we should roll it out and give it to people. But a healthy dose, a d healthy dose of skepticism is important so that you know, we don't appear hyperbolic and too enthusiastic. Because people can, you know, we've been criticized, the researchers have been criticized for being overly enthusiastic in this field. So we have to be cautious. So we have time for one more question. And then Stephen will be outside for people who want to ask more. I know we talked about a lot of different drugs and a lot of different um, uh, issues, but I guess what I'm trying to understand more about is whether the effect, the benefit is primarily a chemical reaction in the brain or if it has to be about consciousness illuminating certain experiences, perhaps in PTSD or depression or things like that. And do we have any insight on, on the balance between those two? The question was about the mechanism of action. Is it at the biochemical level or something deeper? Um, I, I think what's happening is that it's the subjective experience. We found in our cancer trial, we asked people how personally meaningful or spiritually significant. About three out of four said this was the singular top five most meaningful, most spiritual experience of their entire lives. Highly rememberable up there with like having kids giving birth and they're able to draw on that experience. We give them the music afterwards, they're able to play it, go back into the experience, they write about it. So I think this is neuroplasticity in memory. This is a powerful memory that um, leads to changes that endure 
over time. Now, there may be a neurobiologic signature, there may be brain systems that are rewired, there may be epigenetic and genetic changes. Um, so it, what we don't know is the mechanism of action. We don't know the mechanism of action of any psychiatric disorder. This falls into that, but we are starting to peer into the brain and find neural correlates of what may be going on. But I, I think it's a powerful experience, and not like just some amazing euphoric experience, it's powerful, challenging experiences. Almost all of our patients go through something very difficult. They have some consequential encounter with their disease state. And they, a lot of people say, you know, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. I would never do it again, but I found it so incredibly helpful. So I, I think it's the richness of these experiences that's doing the therapeutic thing. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you for your time.